and it will have a total of 50 points. Okay. And uh, you should time yourself well. Okay, so that's all. <laughs> okay. So that's it. So, so that's the. <coughs> So one thing I'm avoiding, which I learned from the midterm, is having uh, one one question that's worth more than five points, five or six points. I think I will avoid that. So, all right. So, so any other question? Yeah. Uh, is it like open and like count? Notes? Yes, it's the same policy as the midterm. So it's open and you can count. You're not allowed to use the internet while you're here. But other than that, you can use it. Yeah. In terms of like yeah. the formal proofs versus like reasonable argument, are you going to begin like explicitly state what? Yeah. I will explicitly state what uh, what is needed out of these questions. Yeah. 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 Right, so the question is what portion of the final exam will be from uh, like prior to the midterm? About 50%. Okay. we did in the course, right? So this is like uh, just a very short list of various things that we did. So, so we start out by doing divide and conquer and uh, yeah, and, and then we said that generally the idea is very simple, it's something that you would normally do, divide the problem into subproblems, try to solve them separately and try to patch the solutions together. And all the divided conquer analyses that we did were, uh, or, or most of them, were uh, via recurrences. So we, so we had to figure out what the appropriate subproblem was, and uh, or what the size of that subproblem was, and uh, using that you could write out a recurrence. And uh, yeah, and solving that recurrence gives you a closed form for the running time. And uh, yeah, the, the one non-trivial algorithm that we saw there is this uh, problem of linear time selection, which, uh, yeah, I mean, as you probably guessed from the midterm, is one of uh, my favorite algorithms. And <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's very clean and it's surprising because it allows you to, uh, if you're given some unsorted array, you can find the kth smallest element without sorting. So that's a nice. So, so that's something good to know. And uh, right, so the next uh, topic we saw is uh, is based is dynamic programming, where the idea is very similar to divide and conquer in the sense that you express the solution as uh, a solution to the subproblem. But we often use it for things like uh, where, where somehow you can characterize the subproblem in a fairly succinct. And the main idea then was that you avoid solving, repeatedly solving some problems. And then the program is useful in problems where well, the number of subproblems is quite small. Okay, so that you can actually remember all the answers to some problems. And uh, we'll see this in a little bit. So I thought that today I will focus a little bit on dynamic programming and on optimization formulae. And uh, yeah, especially like what you need to do. Things. And uh, right, so that's one thing. The next uh, next topic we did was greedy algorithms, and uh, these are algorithms which you know somehow you have to make a sequence of choices, and each time you take the choice that seems the best at this point in time. And uh, often how how you define it, I mean, what you consider the best, and so on, is what you got to figure out. So that's something we looked at. And uh, we 
we did some basic problems like minimum spanning tree. And we also looked at some approximation algorithms for problems like set cover, vertex cover, and so on. So vertex cover, I think, is uh, you, you did it in one of your homeworks. It's a very simple problem, and there we could get like a factor two approximation. It was quite surprising. So that's what we did. And, uh, and then we looked at a little bit at shortest paths because this is like one of the very very basic graph algorithms that you should know. And uh, main result is uh, yeah. Let me just write out the results there. Yeah, these are the kind of complexity blocks that you should just know off the top of your head. So the standard. Uh, you have a graph G, this can be directed. You can have some edge lengths and so on. So then shortest path between any U to B. This can be found. In fact, shortest path from U to all the vertices in the graph. Right? So this is how the tree was constructed. Uh, I will get you in a minute. So we pronounce that. Better now? Yeah. Yeah, so these shocks are not as uh, so some some talks write very well, the things are not like that. So all right. So shortest path from U to V, and then more generally U to all vertices, all other vertices can be found via the Dijkstra algorithm, and this takes time. O of m plus n times log n can be optimized a little bit, but we don't really care. Okay, so this is uh, where m is the number of edges. having 
like two different parts. So one is when you where we cover some of some of the more basic ones, if any of you probably saw before. And those are like the first few things. And then uh, randomized algorithms and optimization, maybe not all of you have seen before. So these will be somehow the new things that, uh, uh, I mean, like, yeah. For many of you, many of these things will be new, but, uh, and that's by design. But, uh, yeah, but these may be much fewer of you will see. Okay, so these are the, the, the other topics. Okay, and randomized algorithms, we did in a fair amount of detail. So we said that, uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes allowing randomness, you get some surprising power. Right? So we saw this with like primarily testing kind of uh, problems there. Okay, so yeah, so that's something we can do. And then we also analyzed uh, balls and bits. Right? So yeah, let me summarize what we did. So yeah. The first kind of thing we did there was quicksort. I forget if we did, did we do quicksort or did we do median selection? Quicksort. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we did, yeah. Okay, so, so here, yeah, the, the, the algorithm was very simple, but the point here was to introduce this notion of the expected running time. Said that uh, this is a nice notion to study in general and randomized algorithms. Because sometimes algorithms will take very long, but uh, in expectation, the running time is usually quite long. Okay, so, so that was a nice thing about quick start. And uh, yeah, and, and then we said that computing expectations is a nice thing because we have things like Markov's interval. And uh, so this tells you that oh, if you have a bound on the expected running time, then your actual running time will not be much more than that with a decent problem. So that's uh, something we saw. Many problems in homework five used Markov, more, more than a couple. So that's a very useful thing to keep in mind. And then we also looked at uh, hashing by looking at balls and uh, this balls and bits process. And uh, I said that this is an idealized view of hashing. If you had like a perfectly random hash function, then it would behave like these balls and bins process. And uh, so, so that's the next stuff to look at. And the idea there was to also play with this notion of expressing uh, is generally to look at random variables. And uh, expressing random variables as sums of other. Okay, so this we did uh, for a bunch of problems. Right, and that was kind of the nice uh, summary of this. Like we had this, uh, like what is the expected number of balls that fall into a bin and things like this, which we could compute in a fairly simple manner by actually doing tricks of this kind. So if we tried to compute these quantities directly, they were a mess. But if you if you actually express them as sum of similar and the effect was much nicer. So that's something we did. And uh, right, and then we also looked a little bit at sampling and estimation. <laughs> and here the point was to say that okay, if, if you had a if you had some quantity that you that you would like to find, now if you don't care really about computing it exactly. Then uh, can just sampling and uh, estimating the quantity of interest. How good is it? Okay. And uh, we had this notion of we could come up with confidence bounds. And so that was like a big uh, new thing that we saw there. Okay. So 
yeah, if you've taken a probability or st stats course, you probably saw lots more of these than what we did, but we saw some simple versions of uh, confidence bound. And basically, what the kind of guarantee you'll get is that if you take a certain number of samples, like if you take, uh, so this is, suppose you take some S sample, yeah, maybe we call it K, then uh, you have an error, which at least in the kind of problems we looked at was something like uh, 1 by K with probability at least three quarters. So maybe there were constants here. So, so error is, uh, but I want to illustrate the kind of bond we get. So the kind of bond we get is that the error will be somehow bounded by some function of k with some problem. Okay. So it's a, uh, that's why I call these confidence bonds. So this is at least the notion of confidence bounds you should uh, be able to understand. Right? So any any parts of this where you thought that you could use some little bit of review? If not, I will talk a little bit about dynamic programming. I mean, I will finish that and then talk about dynamic programming. Yeah? Um, can you talk a little bit about Chevy Chev's inequality and why we should think about using that? Oh yeah, so it's kind of complex now too. So all of these are uh, are in this general class of uh, concentration inequality. Okay, so like Markov, Chebyshev, and so on. But uh, mm -hmm. let me define those. Yeah, so as such, Chebyshev's inequality is something very simple. It's just that well, the way we used it probably is, some, is, is the reason why, uh, and we also used it uh, in a lecture where we did a bunch of other computations, so it was probably taxing. <laughs> okay, so yeah, but but uh, in general, so you, let's say you have some random variable x. Yeah. So x is some random variable, and uh, expected value of x, let me define it as mu. Okay. So the expected value is in some sense the, the, the average value that this random variable takes. Right? So that's why I do not by mu. We said that this is a very important quantity of random variables. Turns out that another very important quantity is what we call uh, v, which is the the variance of this. Okay, so we, it's often written as variance of x, and uh, this is defined as the expectation of yeah. So uh, let me write it in uh, of this new random variable y, which is defined. Y is X minus mu whole square. Okay. So, so this is the definition of the variance. Okay. And uh, so it turns out that for many random variables, actually for a few random variables, uh, the, the variance could be infinity. Okay, so do you guys happen to know of examples like this? So common, yeah, common example is Cauchy random variable. So with the, if you if you have a heavy tail, right? So if you if your random variable has a highish probability of deviation, then it's uh, yeah the variance can be infinite. But uh, yeah, but in for variables for which the variance is defined, it's actually a useful quantity. Okay. So right. So, so so that's uh, general. So now what does Markov say? Okay, so, so, so actually let me write down the general uh, yeah, general principle behind concentration inequalities. Okay. 
Okay, so these are inequalities that tell you quantify how close x typically is. to the expected value. Okay, so if you have, uh, so some random variables are much more concentrated, right? Like, uh, so if you had a random variable whose distribution looked like this, this intuitively is much more concentrated than a random variable that maybe is, uh, is uniformly spread out. Okay, so, and concentration inequalities try to get at something like this. Okay, okay so, so the first concentration inequality that we saw, which is the most basic, yeah, which, which is uh, very trivial, is Markov's inequality. Okay, so what this says is that for a non-negative, random variable x. So, and it's important that this is non-negative. I don't know, was there a problem in one of the homeworks uh, asking, say, give a counterexample? Not this time, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, not this time. But, uh, yeah, so if you have a non-negative random variable x, then the probability a uh, non-negative random variable is just something that always takes non-negative values. So that probability that x is more than some uh, t times the expected value. Okay, that is uh, we write as t mu is less than one. And this is only giving you, uh, yeah, so, so what this is saying is that if I have a random variable that, let's say it's, uh, this is zero, so it's always on the right side, and its uh, density function looks like something like this, and let's say the mean was something over here, then it's saying that the probability that you are, let's say, more than, let's say, uh, three mu, this mass is at most one term. Okay. So pictorially, this is what Markov's inequality is telling us. So the probability that you are more than t times the expectation is something like that. Okay. Now Chebyshev is doing something nicer. So this is a bit more, this is a bit nicer for Random variables that have a variance, okay, where the V is well defined. So what this tells us is that for any random variable, X, okay, the probability that is more than t times square root of the variance. I said that square root of the variance is this quantity called standard deviation. Right? So, yeah, so, so what this is is this is less than equal to 1 by t square. So this is, in some sense, a nicer statement. I mean, at least in some cases, it's a nicer statement. Because imagine your uh, variance is some, let's say v equals 1. So if you have a random variable whose variance is 1, then what it's saying is that, let's say it, has, it looks like something like this. It's saying that the probability that you are, so yeah, v is 1. The probability that you are within an interval, let's say, and this is mu plus minus 2 of this uh, variance. Okay. So v is 1, so square root of v is also 1. 
So the probability that you are in uh, outside of this range, okay, which is this plus this, this area plus this area, okay, this is at most one fourth. And that is a powerful statement that Chebyshev's inequalities make. Okay, so it's in fact telling you that. Uh, so note that here, if your mu was large, let's say mu was a, if you had a random variable with a large mu, but maybe small variance, then this was very weak, right? So if your mu was something like a hundred, and your variance was one. Okay, so this was a random variable that maybe looked like this. So where it had, uh, it looked like this. So variance was kind of small, but the mean was 100. Now Markov doesn't give you anything interesting. It tells you that the probability that you are more than some 300 uh, is at most one third. Okay. But if you use uh, Chebyshev, then you are in great shape. Then it tells you that probability that you are more than one, one or two, or less than ninety-eight. Right? Mm -hmm. In fact, the sum of the two probabilities is smaller than one four. Okay. So, so, but yeah, you can also come up with cases where both are almost equally good or bad, depending on how you look at. Okay, and Chebyshev also you cannot use it if uh, the variable has infinite variance. Okay, which could happen. Okay. So, so yeah, and, and as I was saying, there are other concentration inequalities as well, things that are more complicated than Chebyshev. And uh, generally, the theme there is you want to quantify how close a random variable is to the expected value. And uh, yeah, so these kind of bounds, they're called deviation bounds. So, so yeah, so, so that's Chebyshev. And uh, yeah, but the proof of Chebyshev is actually very trivial, like I said before. So it is that you just apply Markov to x minus mu whole square. And this is what we saw in, uh, in class as well. So even though this is somewhat looks stronger, it's, uh, it basically follows from Markov. All right, so that's a little bit of uh, background. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, good. So let's, uh, yeah. So let's go on. So let's go on to the the next topic we saw, which is uh, optimization formulations. Right. So here, these are again. So we saw it for earlier two problems. Okay, so this was a picture that we said we should keep in mind, right? So you have, uh, and yeah, actually, uh, maybe I should have done this even during the thing, but the canonical example you should keep track of is, let's say, vertex cover, because it's a, it's a very simple problem, and maybe it's one case where you would not start off by writing down an optimization formula, right? unless you are used to thinking this way. So we have the instance of the problem. Let, let's, uh, for the sake of the recap, let's just focus on vertex cover. So what is vertex cover? You have a graph G.
Okay, so this problem, the first time you saw it was in one of the homeworks where you had to come up with like a greedy algorithm where you had to show that some greedy algorithm was a factor to a Right? So, okay. So, so writing this as, uh, so what does it mean to write it as an optimization problem? We have to come up with some variables and some constraints okay, and some uh, objective value. Right? So, in this case, we said that uh, if ultimately the goal is to find some set S. So we said that uh, you introduce Boolean variables, xi is supposed to be 0, 1, and uh, supposed to indicate if i is an s. Okay. And uh, we said that you can, yeah, so, so you have variables like this and uh, you can write out constraints. So what were the constraints? formulation was very simple, right? Because the problem itself kind of like this. The problem itself was begging for writing down the formula because it was basically saying, you know, you want to find some subset of uh, vertices and they have to satisfy some constraints. And you want to minimize the total number of things you picked. Right? So, so you want to minimize sum over all u of uh, x u. <coughs> And this we said is our like base optimization computation, and you can hope to feed it into some optimizer which uh, which solves this problem. Okay. And the main thing we said is that the solver does not know that it is solving some. Uh, it is trying to solve some vertex count problem. Right? All it knows is that oh, okay, there are these variables, there are these constraints. I need to find. Uh, I need to find some uh, optimal solution to this op optimization problem. So it has no idea that uh, that you actually need to solve some set cover instance or something like that. Okay. And uh, this is why we said uh, we should be careful when writing out uh, an optimization problem. Right. So so okay. So the solver solves this and produces some solution. And we said that from there you should be able to read off a solution to the original problem. And uh, this is uh, is trivial in this case because a solution is basically some xi being zero or one. So if it is one, we include it in the set in the set S. If it's zero, we don't include it. In the set. And then you can say that any a uh, feasible solution to this optimization formulation will actually give a feasible solution to what is called. And uh, therefore, the best solution will give the best solution. Yeah. Feasible just means that anything that satisfies both these constraints, but it may not be the minimum. Okay. So, so yeah. So, feasible just means satisfies all the Any other questions? Yeah. How would you like formally show that uh, you know each problem like that they went together? Is this five? Yeah, so you have to show uh, I mean okay. In most cases you don't have to like uh, I mean it is all you would need is like a couple of lines of explanation. Right? But uh, there are some cases where you might need more. But what you have to show is that 
that basically this problem and the optimization formulation are equivalent. So you have to show something over here and something in going back from a solution to the optimization problem. Right? So, so in this case, for example, what you can, uh, yeah, so, so what we want to show is that the optimum of, of original problem, let's, let's call it problem P. We would like to ultimately argue that uh, optimum of version problem P is the same as optimum of this formulation. Or let's call it opt formulation. Right? So the best solution to this is the same as the best solution to this. And you can verify it in both directions. Okay, so first you say that any solution of the original problem corresponds to some solution over here. Uh, and in this case that is very easy. So if you had some solution here which is S, it will be a feasible solution over here. Because uh, you, you just put Xi being 1 if a vertex i was an S and 0 otherwise. And uh, if it was feasible, which means that every edge has at least one endpoint in S, then this condition must obviously be satisfied. And uh, yeah, therefore if you try to minimize it, uh, yeah, and uh, right, if you try to minimize it, then you're actually finding the smallest size. So, so this is, yeah, so this is one direction. And the other direction is also very easy in this case, because if you had a zero one solution, the way you would come up with an S is just uh, include everything for which x i is equal to one. So this translation between solutions is what what you need to show. So a feasible solution of one corresponds to a feasible solution of the other. Okay. So yeah, and sometimes you may not be able to come up with uh, just the feasible solution. Sometimes this thing may may only be true for optimum solution. But all the examples we see. We actually just looked at the, uh, yeah, all feasible solutions of one formulation are also feasible solutions. Yeah, but that's a good point. So this is what you need. And sometimes this is not obvious. So, yeah, this, this time in the course we didn't see examples where this is not obvious. Uh, I think the only non-trivial example we saw of writing down the formulation was spanning tree. Where you had exponentially many text chains. So, yeah. But this is a very, very uh, useful paradigm in practice because you tend to, I mean, usually you have some optimization problem, you don't know how to solve it, you try to, uh, I mean, phrase it using some variables and constraints and feed it to a solver. This also is one thing. But uh, I copy pasted the wrong figure. But uh, yeah, so the other thing that we saw is this paradigm of uh, relax syndrome. Okay, so we basically we said that sometimes you cannot, uh, or at least if you wanted some theoretical guarantees, then you cannot solve optimization problems like this. Yeah, because these are some discrete optimization problems, these turn out to be empty hard in general. Okay, although in practice often you can solve problems like this. So we said that what we can solve are linear programs. Okay, so, so basically optimum 
my address and are guaranteed to work work efficiently only for some very restricted classes of uh, uh, of optimization foundations, right? So, so, so this is uh, take it with a pinch of salt, but only for like convex foundations. So at least the, the I mean, if you if you want like guaranteed solutions. Then uh, these only work for like convex formulations, and uh, yeah, and if you don't want to think too much about this, then uh, yeah, one concrete example of this is linear optimization. And uh, here we said that everything is the same, so so you want uh, linear constraints and linear objective, so. What are what are linear constraints? What does linear constraints mean? What those which is the Yeah, so you have some variables. Let's say your variables are some x u's, then uh, linear constraints are basically some alpha 1, x1 plus alpha 2, x2. Alpha is a constant. Like uh, let's say you have some x1 plus 2, x2 plus something. Things like this bigger than or equal to some beta 1. Okay. So constraints of this kind. These are linear constraints. Okay. Uh, where you have some constants and uh, you have some linear constraints. And, and linear object. Okay, so here the objective is also of the same kind. Okay, and uh, in, in this case, we have linear constraints and the linear objective because this is just sum over all u of x u. And here you just have x u by x u bigger than to the one. Everything is uh, everything is linear. Okay. But the main catch in linear optimization is that the optimization is not over a discrete domain, but it's unconstrained. So, and in this case, we said that okay, you can make, you can add the constraint zero less than or equal to x u less than to one, because these are just two linear constraints. One is this, and one is this. So these are two. Linear, so you can add something like this, but you can't say that x u belong uh, is either zero or one. So you can only say that x u, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So, right. So he's asking about the first question of this homework, right? So where uh, you have something like you wanted to minimize something like max over. Yeah. Let, let me write a slightly restated version of this. So max over i of. Uh, Let's say u i transpose x. Okay. And he's asking why is this not a linear objective? Okay. So the point is that if it would be a linear objective, this whole thing could be written as some c transpose x for some fixed c. Okay. So now I have gone from x being a bunch of scalars to x being a vector. So, some, I mean, you prefer you can write it with some with the bar if you are used to that sort of language. But usually we skip it and we just say x x without subscript means this, and uh, ui is also a vector. So let me yeah. so so each ui is a vector. So you have a bunch of vectors, and we are looking at max over all i. So it's like saying 
Suppose I have max of x1 plus x2 and 2x1 plus x uh, minus x2. If I have a max of two linear functions, in general you can't write it as some alpha 1 x1 plus x, alpha 2 x2. So this is not a linear function okay, for this reason. Right? So the max of two linear functions is not itself a linear function. Right? So this is why this is not a priori, uh, uh, I mean, a linear optimization function. Okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the question there was an absolute value. Yeah, in the question there was an absolute value. Problem. That is also a problem, yeah. But I think many people observe that an absolute value can be replaced by two things, is x and minus x. So, yeah. But if you have something like this, then this, uh, yeah. So this is why it's not by itself a linear operation. So that's why you had to do some tricks to. Yeah, to, to, to get to actually phrase this as a linear option. Good. So, okay. So, so linear optimization is one class that we know how to do well. And what is now relaxing now? So you take optimization problem of this kind, and we call this star. Now you say that okay, I uh, so that's like a discrete optimization. We don't know how to do discrete optimization well, at least provably. There are heuristics, but we don't know how to do it well. So instead of solving star, replace star with this new linear optimization problem, where I simply replace the first constraint with 0 less than equal to xi less than equal to 1 and uh, I have the same stuff for all u v x u plus x v equal to 1 and then I try to minimize sum over u v x okay. so this is a linear optimization <laughs> problem let me call this uh, so, yeah, then we can maybe call this uh, 2. So, now there was a question earlier about uh, how do you show that uh, the original problem was equivalent to the optimization complex, right? And I said that you must be able to translate solutions of one to the solutions of the other. But if you try to do the same thing with this 2, you will fail because 2 can have so feasible solutions that are of the kind. Uh, uh, I think we saw this example where if you have a triangle, you can put x u equals r for for all vertices, and this would satisfy all these constraints, right? So there is no obvious way of converting uh, this solution, or at least. Uh, yeah, so, so this solution does not canonically correspond to a solution of the original problem, right? With at least one that has the same objective value. So this is why the original problem is not equivalent to this formula. So I'm just trying to go back to this question that somebody asked earlier about, uh, oh, how do you show that the original problem is equivalent to that formula? I'm saying that there we said that uh, to show something like that, you have to take feasible solution of one and say that it's also feasible for the other. And if you try to do that with this formulation, you will fail because if you take a feasible solution to this, which is this, this makes absolutely no sense for the original problem because now what does it mean to have a 
uh, a vertex with half. So it makes you equal. So this why, yeah, so, so this one is a different formulation. This is not equivalent to the original one. Right? So any questions? Okay. So this is, yeah, so this kind of formulation is often called a relaxation. It's called a relaxation because we took this equality which was x i belong to 0, 1 and we replaced it with this. So we are strictly increasing the feasible set. So these are weaker constraints. So instead of saying that x i is either 0 or 1, I'm replacing it with a weaker constraint. That's why it's called a relaxation. Okay, so you are relaxing the constraint. So this is called relaxation. And this one, and most optimizers can solve really well because these are just uh, simply this is just a simple linear program, but produces some optimal solution to this problem, which may not actually be integral. So we said that yeah, you can come up with the optimizer can produce a solution like this. Then we said that at least in certain cases, you can there's still a reasonable way to convert such a solution into a feasible solution for the original problem. And in this case, the solution we proposed was rounding up everything that was more than or equal to half to one. And in this case, you will end up actually picking all three vertices. So, so that was this relaxing round paradigm. Okay, and then we had to show that in the process of rounding, you will actually come up, so round Okay, so it takes some solution x for this and uh, it produces a solution to original. And because the original problem was equivalent to star, you can think of it as producing a solution to star okay, if, you, if you like to think. So this is this relax and round paradigm. And uh, I guess in your homework you saw one example where you can do a little bit tighter analysis of this. Right? So I don't remember which problem it was, maybe four or three or four. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the problems you did a bit bit more tight analysis. Okay. All right. So that's the relax and round paradigm. Okay, so this is uh, Any other questions? Okay. So, all right. So, so, so finally, I wanted to do a quick recap of dynamic programming, right? Because I think many of you still have, uh, I, I think, some kind of uh, uh, like difficulty coming up with what what exactly your problem, some problem should be. Okay. And one thing you should note is that this is normal. Okay. In the sense that. Uh, Often the trick in dynamic programming is realizing how to define the subproblem, and this is, uh, I mean, that's so why if you if you guys can if you is used to these programming contests, some of the hardest problems are dynamic programming ones because uh, you have to figure out the right way of the phrasing it as a dynamic program. So, yeah. so let's do a quick recap and. Uh, So we saw the we saw a bunch of examples in class, right? So, and I thought that maybe, yeah, this uh, and and all of them have this notion of some kind of a sequential decision making.
So sometimes it may not be sequential decision. I mean, it may not look like sequential decision making to start with, but uh, you may end up doing solving it as some kind of a sequential decision. Can you guys think of an example where we did this, or at least a homework problem where you? Yeah. So there, if you remember, a few homeworks ago, there was this problem of uh, there were these intervals, right? So 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 you had intervals that had a certain cost. And uh, you had to, yeah, you had to somehow fix a subset of them so that they didn't overlap and their total cost was as large as possible. At least mathematically, that was problem, right? So, so right. So there, it, 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 the problem was not phrased as some kind of sequential decision making, right? But you could. You could somehow view it as sequential decision making by saying that oh, okay, I will sort the intervals in a certain order, and in this case, it happens to be the order where uh, you sort by the starting point, and then I make a sequential choice like oh, will I pick the first interval or not? Then will I pick certain thing or not? So, okay. so, so quite often you view it like this. Okay, so, so you you, you would convert the problem into one where okay. and uh, right and, and for example in this cake uh, cake eating problem. Oh, it's not cake cutting. Sorry, cake cutting is another popular problem. But cake eating problem. So there, we had to figure out. Oh, how many to eat on day one? How many pieces to eat? And so on. Right? So on day two. And so on. So it was. It was naturally some kind of a sequential thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So why is that? I thought that would be once you figure out what each sub problem is, that is probably the easier part, right? Um well like the subset sum. Uh huh. Oh yeah, okay. Your sub problem kind of is like should we include this element in the subset or should we not, right? No. So <laughs> So uh, okay, so let, let's do something some in a bit more detail. Okay, so okay, so firstly, let me finish with this. Okay, so so that's the sequence of decisions that you've got to make, right? But your sub problem is not that. Okay, so that's what I would like to say. Okay, so right in subset sum, so the sequence of decisions is. Uh, you know whether you include a one in your set or whether you include a two in your set or not, and so on. Okay, but that's not the sub problem that we are defining. Right? So to define a sub problem, you've got to say suppose I've made decisions for for like like up to a certain time scale. Okay, so you've converted your problem into a sequence of decisions. Let's just abstractly call it some kind of first decision, second decision, and so on. Okay, and the number of decisions may not always be fixed and so on, but let's pretend that it is. Okay, so at least for subset sum it is you have to make one decision per per uh, element. Right. So, so what you say is okay, so suppose I have made all the decisions so far. What is the remaining uh, I mean what do I is there a succinct way of capturing the remaining problem. Okay. So, so having made the first let's say T decision What is the remaining? Uh, what is, in some sense, the remaining problem? Okay. 
Okay, and this is what you should be able to answer in a, in a, in a fairly succinct way. Okay, and uh, in subset sum, this was easy, right? So in, in subset sum, your original goal was you had some target sum S and you had to pick some subset of A1 through AN. And uh, the decisions here were just whether you pick A1 or not, whether you pick A2 or not, and so on. And uh, so if you've made decisions about these guys, so let's say I decided to pick one, this one, not pick this one, not pick this one, and let's say I'm at this point, then if overall I need to get a sum of S, okay, then I know that so far I've only included a, a of 1. Now my sub problem is basically using all of these guys, can I get a sum? Okay, so let me write it a bit. After making the first three choices, so then uh, and and I'm assuming that the first three choices were you decide to include one, not include two and three. The sum of s minus a. Okay, so is there a subset of these guys that adds up to s minus a. And we said that uh, these are, in general, well, I mean, if you think about what happens after some time r, you have something where you have a r plus 1 through a n, and you will have some, some integer over here. And we said that you can only, I mean, if all of these are non-negative, then you can only restrict to, uh, so, so these values. belong to uh, our integer in 0 through s. Okay. So that's what we said. Okay. And, uh, and, and in general, we said that, uh, yeah, so all the subproblems we will ever be interested in, so all subproblems we will solve, Will, will look like you have some starting index, so you have some uh, start index and some required total. And you, you're basically trying to use numbers between a of start idx through a n and you would like to make the sum which is whatever this requires right so yeah so a key thing when you are thinking about designing dynamic programming algorithms is to try to formulate the sub problem in words okay like try to say okay so what is the sub problem it's parameterized by two things. Okay, one is start index and one is required sum. And you say that, and in words, what you're interested in is, does there exist a subset of A of start index to A of n, whose sum is exactly equal to this required sum. So you have a start index, let's call it uh, j, and 
So then, uh, does there exist a subset of AJ through AN whose so sum is equal to R? And this is in some sense what you, I mean, this is what I mean by this is a subproblem in words, right? Like, and this is this is a full-fledged instance of its own, right? In the sense that you don't need anything else. Yeah, and in particular, like I said in class at the time. Somehow, what decisions you have made in the past don't matter at this point. So everything you've got to do is uh, is phrase, is captured in this subproblem, okay. and that's the main thing in dynamic program. Okay, so somehow you've got to capture everything that you need to know about your remaining instance uh, without knowing what decisions you've made. All right. So that's uh, yeah. So, so that's the main idea. And uh, right. And then we said that now using this idea, you can write out a recursive form. Okay, so it's the notion of subproblems here. Okay, so all right. The main thing is that yeah, you don't know the, you don't care about the history of what decisions you've made in the past. Okay, and uh, right. So now you have a generic recursive formulation. Is uh, you have the and you and you try to write down recursive formulation for this, right? So this is uh, the value of start id x and some required some r. And typically, what you do is you try to make one more decision. And you try to see what decision you've got to make. And uh, here it would be like so you try to solve. So in subset sum, the, the, what you want to output is like a Boolean thing, which is uh, whether it's possible to make that sum or not. And sometimes you may want to actually return the set. So this is actually one of the questions asked. So let me come to that. So for now, pretend that it's a it's a Boolean. Question. You want to know if this if there exists a subset of your given numbers, the sum is S or not. So then you just have to say you, you want to find two subproblems. One is val of start id x plus one r minus a of start id x. So this corresponds to the case when you actually picked the start idea. So, so this is what I was saying. Like you're basically making one decision, right? So because you have this sequential decision making, having made the first whatever decisions, you arrived at this subproblem, and now we are thinking of making one extra decision, and that's what this will. Okay, so that's this, and then you will also look at this this subproblem, which is value of start idx plus one. And just R itself. Okay. So this corresponds to not picking A of start index. Okay, because if you did not pick A of the start index, then it's just like now you've made a decision not to pick, let's say, A4. Then uh, you have to solve the subproblem with the same value of R, but starting five onwards. So, so that's what this is. So, so this is the basic uh, recursive formulation. So, for any subproblem, you will come up with a formulation where basically you make one more decision. Okay. And in this case, it's a Boolean thing. So, you look at both these solutions. If either of them is a one, you return a one. 
So basically what you're doing is a Boolean R of this. Now some of you asked, okay, so what if uh, your goal is not just to do some kind of uh, of finding if it's a if there exists a subset or not, but what if your goal is to actually find the subset? So how do you modify this? Some people, someone answered this on here. Yeah, so. There's a question here. I was just saying that. Uh, yeah, so, so, so if your problem was phrased as a Boolean question, like uh, it, does there exist a subset of indices whose sum is equal to s, okay. then this is something you do. But if the goal was actually to find the actual subset, how would you modify this? Yeah. yeah. Well, at least to me, in the general paradigm. Yeah, so we've used this to set up, like, on lookup, like, essentially store this in some data structure. And then iterate through it, um, looking and seeing like what the actual values are once we've stored. Right, but at least in this uh, in this abstract way. So how did we? We haven't come to the storing part yet. I'm still in the recursive part, right? Uh -huh. So so yeah. So so we'll come to the storing part. Uh, I mean, very very quickly. But uh, but at least over here. So how would you know? Yeah. Or two different, like, do we want like a physical solution or like the best solution? For so a solution? in this case, there's only a best solution, and you have to find a solution that. Uh, yeah, but the question is one of all. I mean, is it like, do you, are you interested in the existence of the solution? Do you actually find what the find? So in this case, you can say that okay, you know, if neither of them was one, then you know that it's impossible. <coughs> Okay, to make a sum of r. Okay. Otherwise, if one of them was equal to one, you just remember which which value ended up being one. Okay. And then you know that if you make this decision <coughs> at this time step, then your subproblem is always bound to return. Uh, I mean, there's bound to exist a solution to your subproblem. So you can basically uh, keep track of which decision you got to make okay. because it's a uh, sequential. Um, so you basically keep track of what is true. And the final thing about dynamic programming is that, yeah, the, the whole point of trying to come up with these subproblems is that if there are not too many distinct subproblems, then you can actually just store all the answers. Yeah, and instead of resolving each time, uh, instead of doing like a recursive problem, you basically store all the answers and. Uh, yeah, or rather, yeah, another way that we saw for doing it is that you compute one of these things only if you haven't computed it. <coughs> and uh, every, all the answers are stored in like a lookup table. Okay, so that was the other main thing about it. Okay, so, so yeah, so, so the number of subproblems and things like this come up in that context because uh, if you want to store all the answers to all the subproblems, then the number of subproblems you solve better be small. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to store all that. So that's the yeah. So that's like a quick summary of the program. We're out of time, but if you have questions, feel free to come by to my office hours. Yeah.